as your moderator, Eyewitness News anchor, Bill Ritter. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. One week from today, New Yorkers will elect their 110th mayor. Now, whoever is elected will, I think it's safe to say, likely face the biggest challenges of any new mayor in this city's history. Keep the pandemic at bay, keep New Yorkers healthy, keep our streets safe from violence, and keep gun insanity, huh, get rid of it. It is so prevalent today. Keep people in their homes or get them off the street and into homes and bring back business and jobs. Our tale of two cities, the haves and have nots, which the current mayor used as a kind of political mantra when he was elected eight years ago, is more profound now than ever. Our goal tonight is to help you understand who these two candidates are, why they want the job, what they do if they had it, and how they would deal with so many very tough questions that don't have easy answers. Candidates, we're looking forward to hearing tonight how you plan to do all that. And let me formally introduce you. First, the Democratic nominee, Eric Adams, who is now the borough president of Brooklyn. And the Republican nominee, Curtis Sliwa, founder of the Guardian Angels. And with me tonight to ask questions, first WABC political reporter, Dave Evans, David, and Univision 41 news anchor, Mariela Salgado. Mariela, nice to see you. We are following, by the way, COVID precautions, including social distancing and no audience in the studio. For the visually impaired, who would like a description of the participants and the stage, the Campaign Finance Board has set up a Twitter page to describe the participants and the stage. It's at NYCF, make that NYCCFB. Now, here are the rules. Each candidate will have one minute to answer the question with an opportunity for a quick 30 second rebuttal to the candidate who gets the question first. For follow up questions, 30 seconds. Answers. By random drawing, by the way, the first question goes to Mr. Adams, and it comes from political reporter Dave Evans of Eyewitness News. We're going to begin with the issue of guns and crime, gentlemen. Thank you, Bill. We are kind of far apart, so if you can't hear me, I, I can certainly speak up. So just <laughs> let me know if you can't hear me. I can hear you fine. <laughs> uh, Mr. Adams, during the pandemic, we've seen uh, an alarming uptick in shootings and murders. Um, you have said in the past that you think stop and frisk or as you say, stop, question, and frisk can at times be an effective tool. But of course, as we saw it used during the Bloomberg administration, it was declared unconstitutional because it targeted young black and brown men. My question to you is, can you give me an example of when and how you think stop, question, and frisk can be an effective tool. Uh, 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 yes, thank you. And you know, when you talk about those young men um, who were stopped, one of them uh, was actually my son. He was stopped, he was questioned, he even identified and stated uh, that my dad is a state senator and it didn't matter and it traumatized him until today. I watch his face every time a car drives by. Here's the way you use it correctly in the plan that I'm going to implement. Number one, you call someone and state that there's a person in front of my home carrying a gun. I saw it in his waistband. The police officer that responds, he has an obligation to stop this person, question this person, and if it escalates to another level, then he can frisk this person. That's the proper use. That is not what we were doing in the city. In this city, we had a predetermined number that we were telling officers to do every day, and they were targeting black and brown communities. That is an abuse of a tool. A tool that's abused is no longer a tool, it's a weapon. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Sliwa, do you disagree? Uh, I must tell you, it's amazing uh, that my opponent, Eric Adams, just this morning on The Breakfast Club said that he had met with gang leaders with bodies, Eric. That means gang leaders who killed and gang leaders who killed awaiting trial. Did you stop questioning and frisk them? Did you report that to the police? Could you tell us who those gang leaders were that you met with and which gangs? I think the public has a right to know for someone who declares himself to be the law and order candidate. Did you do that, Eric? I think our question is, <laughs> where is an example? What kind of an example would you see, Mr. Sliwa, for stop and frisk? Well, that's a used? perfect example. And, Known and, and gang I'll, members. I'll follow up and ask Mr. Adams his response to what you said about Known gang, gang members. members. Those are the people you're going to stop and frisk because they're the ones in retaliatory shootings and drive-bys that are causing people to have to live in solitary confinement in their neighborhoods. Mr. Adams, do you care to respond to... What you said this morning about meeting with gang members. Oh, yes, it's so important. And let's be clear, it's only one candidate on this stage that actually faked crimes. We need to be clear on that. 
while I was protecting people in this city, this candidate on the other side was faking crimes. Here's what I'm doing. Public safety is intervention and prevention. Intervention is right now. I'm speaking to those who have committed crimes to get them out of gangs and tell them what are the pathways, what are the issues. You can find and learn so much on those who commit crimes. Like I spoke to the men and women, at, or the men at Rikers Island when I went to visit there. It's time for us to find out what is causing the violence as well as being intervention and addressing that violence right now. I have a comprehensive plan that I discussed of addressing violence and how we're going to target those gang members that are using guns. Mr. Adams, Eric Mr. Adams, I'm a victim of gang violence. I was shot on the orders of John Gotti Sr. to the Gambino crime family, shot five times with hollow point bullets. Would you have sat down with the Gambino crime family and my shooter, Michael Iannotti, and sat down with them and tried to negotiate organized crime peace? That makes no sense at all. You haven't even met with the police unions. And you're meeting with gang leaders who are responsible for bodies. That means they killed people. And you meet with them and not with the police unions? Let, let, let's move on to a, a, a related question, I think. Uh, Mayor de Blasio this year disbanded a controversial plainclothes uh, unit, the anti-crime unit, uh, because it was so aggressive. Uh, it was involved, of course, in the death of Eric Garner back in 2014. Mr. Adams, you have said that you want to bring that group back of undercover police officers, albeit you have said with many changes. Why do you want it back? Uh, well, I have a clear plan on public safety, and that fits into my overall plan on public safety. See, patrol is both Something that you are acknowledging the officers that are out there and those you don't know that's up out there. That's the balance. If you have the right plain clothes anti-gun unit, that unit would target gangs, target those who are using guns. What you do is keep the in balance and make sure that those officers are doing their jobs correctly. How would I do it? They would, number one, we have the technology. Turn on the cameras. Make sure those cam cameras remain, remain on so that you see the interacting between uh, police and those who are being identified as committing crimes and have the officers assigned appropriately. Listen, it's about conflict resolution, well-trained officers, not what we did in the past under the street crime unit, the unit that I talked about in federal court when I testified against that abuse. Mr. Schley, what do you think that this is a good idea to bring the unit back? 30 seconds. We, we, we've got to keep it real here because the problem within the NYPD is they've gone from 5,500 detectives down to 3,500. They can't investigate all the cases. So you look in Brooklyn where Eric Adams is still the borough president, three out of four of the gang gun cases are not being investigated. There are no arrests that have been made. And Eric, you haven't been at the gang sites. Mother Gaston Boulevard, five were shot drive by Brownsville. Roosevelt Homes, eight were shot. You weren't there. Haitian mother shot twice by okay. gangs in Crown Heights. Time you weren't it. there. And of all places, Carroll Gardens recently, you were not there for the shooting of that 16-year-old girl. All in Brooklyn, where crime and gang violence has exploded. We you all, haven't done your job, Eric. We all agree crime has got to stop, and we all want to see it stop, uh, and especially gun crime. Uh, let's move on to another shot. We got a lot to talk about in this one hour because this is a complex city. And we're going to start our next round of questionings with Marielle Salgado. Thank you, Bill. Gentlemen, we're going to talk about education, something of real concern to parents. We'll start with you, Mr. Sliwa. Mayor de Blasio announced plans to phase out gifted and talented program and replace it with something called Brilliant NYC, which is basically a program to train teachers, uh, focus on teacher training. But the reality is that although the majority of the students of the largest district in the nation are blacks and Hispanics, their participation is less than a quarter in the program. Do you agree with gifted and, uh, and, and talented? Would you keep it, sir? Uh, I have a personal experience in that both of my youngest sons attempted to get into gifted and talented in Queens. Uh, there are about 65,000 children in kindergarten, only 2,500 available slots. I would expand the number of gifted and talented opportunities, especially in the inner city. I don't care if only three or four take the test and qualify. There should be gifted and talented in every school. And children who qualify, whether they're black or Hispanic or white or Asian or Southeast Asian, should be given that opportunity. But there's blowback now 
because Asians and Southeast Asians are doing so well. They beat out my two youngest sons for gifted and talented. They deserved it. There should be more gifted and talented slots so others like my youngest sons and other sons and daughters can have that same opportunity. We can do it. We can expand gifted and talented. Mr. Adams, would you expand it as well? Would you keep the current gifted and talented? Uh, when it comes down to this topic, it's not only professional, it's personal. Uh, you know, I talked about it all the time, sitting inside a classroom with a learning disability, discovering it uh, once I got to college. Uh, that's the failure. If we don't educate, we will incarcerate. I would not only expand the program, I will also have parents, uh, their children, to opt out of taking the test. This way, we would catch all the children who are capable of being gifted and talented. But also, let's also focus on those children that learn differently. Those who have learning disabilities, dyslexia. Let's make sure we provide educational opportunities for them. I would do universal screening uh, for dyslexia and give the support where it is needed. And we must redefine education in our system, in our system not only from K to 12, but from pregnancy through profession. That is how we educate in the 21st century. And I'm excited about what we could do with gifted and talented. And not only an exam is a gift and talent. Let's look at all ways our children are gifted and talented. Thank you, Mr. Adams. A follow-up question for you, Mr. Sliwa. Just today, an FDA panel authorized vaccination for the youngest children from 5 to 11 years of age. Would you uh, support or require those children to be vaccinated in schools? And what about those families who don't want their children to be vaccinated? Would there be an option for those parents? Well, I met many of those families yesterday as they marched uh, from Metro Tech across the Brooklyn Bridge to City Hall to say, wait a second. We just got our children back into public schools. The religious schools and the parochial schools did a magnificent job last year having children in the classroom with their teachers. Finally, we get the children in the public schools, like my own sons, three sons. I have one in high school, junior high school, elementary school. And now all of a sudden, if they can't get the vaccine, or because of religious belief they can't get the vaccine, or the parents are not involved and decide the child should not have the vaccine, after a year and a half of playing Fortnite, of roadblocks, of not getting educated, we've deprived them of a year and a half of education, we're gonna kick them out? We're gonna expel them? What kind of compassion, what kind of care is that from a government that says, if you don't do what we say, Mr. you're out. Kicking kids out of school, no, absolutely not. Thank you, Mr. Sleep. Mr. Adams, what would be your take on that? Would you make kids get vaccinated or would you give parents an option, remote option perhaps? Well, this issue is just such an emotional issue and it's understandable. It's our children, it's our babies. Uh, but let me be clear, New Yorkers, uh, I was there on the ground. I saw what happened to this city. I saw the bodies in front of our hospitals, uh, temporarily morgues. I saw the countless number of people who lost loved ones, leaving their family at the hospitals. I know what COVID did to our city, a formidable opponent. And when we engage in a conversation, we must do it in a responsible way. Not only must we support and protect those children, but also the children they come in contact with. So we should have options. I am open to having the remote uh, options of education, I am open to look at those that the law allows. If you have religious beliefs, I'm able to, I believe we should look at that, but we can't go backwards. COVID devastated our city, our economy, the communities and families are still living with the trauma of COVID. I'm not going to go backwards. We must protect the people in the city. So you will oh, offer and then, remote wait a you, you will we're, offer we're remote gonna, We're going to face firing civil servants this Friday. Hero police officers, firefighters, sanitation workers, healthcare workers who have already been told either you're vaccinated or you're fired. All right, Teachers, Mr. The, this gonna, Friday it is a disgrace. These gonna, people and these mandates and when I'm mayor, I'm hiring them all back and I'm giving them back pay. This is a violation of their rights. Get uh, vaccinated, no but more importantly, if okay, you can't Mr. Alone, Mr. Sliwa, then you should, let's you absolutely should Mr. be Sliwa. able to get tested once a week. Let's just try to keep to the times, please, because we have a lot to cover. Let's just continue with this COVID uh, situation because we, I want to talk about the Friday deadline. The mayor has ordered all city workers to be vaccinated and inoculated by then. If not, if they don't get the shot, they're not fired, sir. They're on leave. And there's a very very big difference, but that has its own problems. And I want to talk about strategy. Mr. Adams, what's, with no pay, Bill. what's your strategy? With no pay. What's your strategy about these mandates? And because 
whoever's elected could inherit thousands of critical workers and first responders uh, who may have walked off their jobs because they refused to get inoculated. Well, how do you protect the city? Uh, uh, Bill, uh, let's be clear. I, I was one of them. Uh, you know, you, I wore you didn't walk off your job, sir. No, I was one of them that was a civil servant. Uh, I did not get here uh, merely because I woke up one day. I protected this city. I know what it is to be a first line responder. And here's what I would have done that I think the mayor did not do. I would have communicated with the unions like I've done so often. And it's about sitting down. What are they asking for? They may want to know what happens on the day that you take uh, the or get the vaccination or if someone get ill after the vaccination. So there are questions and we don't know what those questions are. I would have engaged the credible messengers. That's how you get things done. You speak with the credible messengers, okay. the head of the unions and come up with a resolution. And I believe we could accomplish that. What about talking to your friend and teammate and the man who says he's your political advisor, the mayor Bill de Blasio, and telling him to stop this madness. Do not fire these people on Friday. And again, they could have been tested once a week if they couldn't be vaccinated or wouldn't be vaccinated. It was working with the police. It was working with the firefighters. Wouldn't you agree with me? They should not be furloughed this Friday. Uh, Curtis, I would agree with you that you should display a level of discipline. They laid out rules here, and you should try to show that. You're acting like my son when he was four years old. Show some discipline so we can get to all of these issues. You're interrupting. You're being disrespectful. Show a level of dis discipline. You want to be the mayor of the city of New York? Start with discipline. Eric, Eric, show compassion, show care. Don't just be a robot. People are going to lose their jobs, their income. And when I'm mayor, I hire them back. I give them their full pay. Thank you, Mr. Sliwa. That's right. what I'm going to do. We're going to move on to the next subject. Uh, Dave, you're directed to Mr. Sliwa. Mr. Sliwa, your opponent has, at times, we've heard over the last couple of weeks, several times, called you a clown. Uh, he has called you uh, a, a Trump mini-me. I wanted to see your reaction to that, but I also, by your own admission, you faked crimes, a kidnapping, a robbery in the 90s. So why should voters in New York trust you? Well, you know, it's interesting. He calls me a clown. I guess I'm Pagliacci right across the street. As you know, uh, I could be in Lincoln Center. That's so beneath you, Eric Adams, especially after you wrote an op-ed piece praising the guardian angels. Did I make mistakes early on? Yes, and I've apologized for them. But talking about faking, you fake where you live, Eric Adams. We still don't know where you live. You live in Jersey, most people say. And then you blame a homeless person for your accounting problems with the IRS. For the second time, you've gotten in trouble for wrong filings and you blame some homeless man that you had as your accountant. I hope you don't appoint him, if you get elected mayor, the budget director for the city of New York because Bill de Blasio, your friend, has done enough damage to this city. I can't imagine why you wouldn't just take responsibility. Man up, Eric. Say, it's my responsibility and I'd like to know where you actually live because you keep faking that. Mr. Adams, do you, <laughs> do, do, do you care to respond? And also, do you stand by your comments about him being a clown and a buffoon? Well, I think New York is uh, seeing uh, the example uh, of the clown-like actions. And listen, we're not, we're not his circus, New Yorkers. And yes, I praise the guardian angels, but it really devastated me after protecting their right to patrol the subways to find out that they were faking crimes. Un New Yorkers understand this. It is a crime to fake a crime. He faked a kidnap. He faked a robbery. He faked that he found the gun. He hid money so he would not have to pay child support. That, oh, that, that's not the that city I want to live in. That is scurrilous that you would say that. <laughs> that is scurrilous that you would say that I hid money. I paid every penny of my child support for my three sons, Anthony, Carter, and Hunter. How dare you bring my family into this? I haven't, I haven't at all brought your family into your problems. Please, show some discipline, a modicum of civility. Keep our families out of this. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Mariella? Yeah, I'll start with you, Mr. Adams. During the George Floyd protests, while most were peaceful, we did see some looting and some violence. First, the mayor was criticized for not doing enough, not having enough cops. Also, some accused officers of being overly aggressive. Right now, 65 officers are facing departmental charges. If you were mayor, how would you have hand handled that situation, sir? 
<laughs> uh, you know, thank you. You know, policing is a difficult task. I know how difficult it is, but you know, the nobility of public protection is crucial and it must be held to a high standard. So I would do an analysis of the charges. If you said something that was discourteous or disrespectful, then you should have a penalty that's suitable to that. But if you pull down the face mask of someone, and mace them in the face while their hands were up. You cannot serve in my department. You cannot allow someone to cross the line. And far too many officers have called me and stated that we want a police department that is respected and rebuild trust in our community. And those are the officers we want to serve and protect our city. So it depends on the crimes, it depends on the allegations and what they were found guilty of, I would take appropriate actions. Fair, but they will be appropriate actions. Mr. Sliwa, how would you have handled those protests if you had been mayor? I'll tell you this, uh, the police are always getting criticized. I remember in that summer when there was rioting, shooting and looting in the streets after Mr. Floyd was killed in the streets of South Minneapolis. I noticed Eric Adams was not defending members of the police department who are under attack, who are being assaulted. Look, Molotov cocktails being thrown into their vans. Graffiti all over the city, F the police. All cops are bastards, all cops are bitches. Still, that graffiti is up in the city. Where was Curtis Lewa? I was out in the streets with the guardian angels. When Bill de Blasio, your partner, your teammate in that summer, was telling the cops to stand down, and Chief of Patrol Pachado said, no, 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 and quit. I stood with Pachado. You stood with de Blasio, I went into the streets, I got a broken uh, jaw fighting off the looters and shooters with the guardian angels. We were the only people standing up to the mob. Where were you, Eric Adams? What were you doing? Were you defending the police then? The answer is not. You didn't defend the police at all. You abandoned them. Uh, you I will never abandon the police department. Do you want to respond to that, Mr. Adams? Well, no, I do not, because the record is clear. Everyone knows the position I took around uh, anyone that did anything inappropriate. Everyone knows the op-ed I signed on to. Everyone knows how I stood against violence. My record is clear. Okay. 35 uninterrupted years on fighting on behalf of New Yorkers. I'm proud of that, and everyone in this city is aware of that. Okay. Let me, uh, let's move on to the economy, because a lot of people are interested in that. This pandemic has caused a recession, and we're still trying to climb out of it. New York City budget about 99 billion dollars that's bigger than the budgets of all but four of the states in the United States the city cannot of course rely on federal bailouts to reopen all those closed storefronts that plague the city um, we'll start with Mr. Sliwa what's your strategy do you intend to raise taxes and which ones and if you have to cut the city's budget what would be cut first and foremost thrive the non-existent mental health program devised by, again, your teammate, Bill de Blasio. You never criticized him or his wife. One and a quarter billion dollars spent in five years. We've seen no results. That program gets disbanded. It will not continue when I'm mayor. The Department of Education, $33 billion. And the teachers are not seeing the money. Teachers have to reach into their pockets to pay for supplies of children. There is total bureaucratic control at the Department of Education. Nobody seems to know what these overpaid bureaucrats do. Give more control to the principals, more control to the teachers who are taking care of our most are, are precious saying... gift, the children of our city. And I would like you right now Acknowledge that you would disband Thrive if you happen to be elected mayor of the city of New York. Because you've never credit, okay. criticized it because it was the program of Bill de Blasio and his wife. I, I want to get this right, this, this one statement you made. Are you, you're saying you would cut the Department of Education budget, the public school budget? Oh, I would filter the money that they waste at the top into the classrooms for the teachers, for the principals to educate the children. Because most okay. of that money gets spent in the bureaucracy, uh, swallowed up Mr. into that vortex. Mr. Adams, the same question to you. You know how tough it is out there. What would you do if you had to cut the budget in New York City and would you raise taxes? You know, and when you think about the budget, you know, I say do the same thing we ask everyday New Yorkers to do. Uh, spend what you take in. Uh, when you look at the outer years, uh, 2020. 
2022, 2023, 20, and 2024, uh, we're looking at potentially an average of $4 billion each year. We failed um, to look at the resources that we received from the federal government. Uh, we had cost savings of only 44%, 38% came from uh, our reserve fund, and 18% came from the federal government. That's not sustainable. So what do I do? And here's my plan. Number one, uh, we're going to say to every agency, three to 5% peg cuts across the board. No layoffs because we're not going to impact those low income employees and civil, civil service. Two, let's go after the families and help them. Universal child care to get our families working and able to be employed. Build our economy. We're too bureaucratic, too expensive, and too difficult to do business in. We can turn around this economy by, number one, looking after the families, getting them employed, and number two, have a more efficient government. Okay. We're not doing that. Thank you. Let me ask you both a question. Simple question. People are interested in this. Come January 1st, we're going to be the highest tax state in the country between all the taxes between the city and the state a lot of people want, want me to ask this question are you with a show of hands are you pledging not to raise taxes if you're elected mayor I'm, I'm in fact pledging to reduce taxes you know how no congestion pricing which will cut crush the middle class coming okay. in from Staten Island we'll talk, we're going to talk about that in a second and uh, get we'll, rid of the speed cameras right. that's a hidden tax thank you Mr. Sliwa we're going to talk about that in a few seconds I do want to turn this out around a bit you've been asking questions and you, you asked him several questions already but I, you do take questions during this campaign that's part of campaigning and we appreciate the public service you all are doing for running for office it is not easy we all know that and we respect you for that we want to turn it around a little bit I'd like to have each of you ask a question of the other person anything you want mr. Sliwa you can ask mr. Adams a question about anything and you have a minute to answer mr. Adams and vice versa Eric Adams I make many campaign stops today amongst Republicans Bill Ritter I just have to offer uh, just a correction I am the Republican candidate but also the independent party candidate that many people will vote for me for mayor on. my mistake I'm sorry Right. And when I'm talking to these groups, I tell them, and if the voters determine that Eric Adams should be the mayor of the city of New York, I will give you my total support because we need to save this city from the brink of Is fiscal there... collapse and crime. Would you return the same sentiment if the voters elect me the next mayor? Would you give me your full support? I do not uh, support human beings. I support the position. Uh, when you wear a bulletproof vest, Curtis, and protect the children and families of this city, you protect the positions that goes with it. And I'm always going to protect this city. This is a city that I love, and I'm not going to see it unravel and be irresponsible. So whomever is the mayor of this city or any of the elected official, I'm going to be there and show them the, the necessary support that they deserve. We're in this together, New York, and I'm going to be there for you. So you would support me in the effort to save our city okay. from your friend, your partner, Bill de Blasio, who single-handedly has destroyed this city that we love with your help. I think we can go on to Mary Ellen. Okay, Mary Ellen. I'm going to talk about the weather. I'll start with you, Mr. Sliwa. In days like today, with heavy rain, there is a serious concern about flooding in illegal basement apartments. As you know, they affect minority communities more than most. At least 11 people die from Ida in basement apartments. The city has an estimated 50,000 illegal units. So would you shut them down if you were elected? And where will you put the people that live there? We're talking about 100,000 residents that live currently in those settings. It's clear that illegally subdivided basements or illegally constructed apartments are the responsibility of the landlord, okay. the superintendent, or the building manager. They are breaking the law and risking people's lives. That must be stopped, but we can't just kick people out. We have to find them housing. Some of these basement apartments can meet the specifications, but my opponent, Eric Adams, has that same problem. He claims to live in that basement apartment on Lafayette and bed -Stuy. The Department of Buildings has put up notices, Eric, I don't know, you haven't taken them off the door, that says that you have so built Mr. an illegal so Mr. Sliwa, subdivided basement apartment that you Mr. claim Sliwa. to live. Why not answer the Mr. Department Sliwa, of Buildings? Speaking to the question then what is to you to stop and desist sir would you shut them down then would you shut them down then 
those Eventually, apartments. yes, but first find the landlords and the people responsible for housing these people in inhumane conditions. Mr. Adams, what will uh, be your plan to deal with the situation, these basement units where so many people live right now? Uh, you know, uh, th uh, thank you for that question. That's a real issue and a real question. And living on the verge of homelessness, uncertainty of knowing where you are, over 100,000 children are having housing insecure uh, right now in this city. Uh, we need to uh, do the right things for these families. And here's my plan to do so. Number one, no, I would not uh, displace them and further aggravate our housing crisis. We need to deal with the immediate concerns with storms and use GIS mapping to identify those locations where those apartments are to have proper notification during storms. Then we need to partner with the Department of Builders, FDNY, to legalize these apartments. There's a great initiative to do so. I will lean further into that to make sure we could do so. I would not displace families without understanding the complexities of aggravating our housing, housing crisis we have right now. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Would you go after the Slayer. Dracula landlords who put these people in peril? Would you lock them up? Would you find them, Eric Adams? No, because they're your supporters. All right, thank you guys. Let's uh, let's continue with that. Basement apartments, of course, is one issue in the fight against climate change. But the last two mayors we've had, Bloomberg and de Blasio, have broached plans to deal with New York City's unique vulnerability to rising waters. They even talked about putting up a wall around lower Manhattan. What specifically would you do to protect this city against rising waters and other effects of climate change. We're gonna begin with Mr. Adams. Uh, you know, I was out there, uh, Bill, um, during the uh, last storm, not the one we had last night. I was actually out last night. You know, I guess that's the police in me. I'm always out trying to figure out how we could help folks. So. The last storm we had, the major one, it was not high tides. We need to be clear on that. It was rain. And so you can't put a Band-Aid on the crises that we created. So specifically, number one, let's use our capital dollars. This is an opportunity to have one solution, a multitude, multitude of problems. A major green infrastructure deal to do some of the things that I saw uh, in Hoboken where they built uh, retaining water, pools to catch water, over, uh, put basketball courts on top of them. Let's make sure that we have a proper notification system in place Thank and you. let's also build those walls to keep water out at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Mr. Sliwa. Bill, I'm glad you brought up the seawall. Not just for lower Manhattan, the battery and the financial district. Not one brick, no mortar has been laid. We got all the money after Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Haven't spent a penny to actually build a wall. And on Staten Island, from the Verrazano Bridge, as you go along the East Shore, was supposed to be five and a half miles. That whole area was underwater. Not one brick, no mortar. People don't trust politicians because they never built those seawalls. I don't trust politicians because they get the money and then they don't spend it. Those walls need to go up because another superstorm, Sandy, is on its way as mayor. I promise you, residents of Staten Island and those of you in the Battery and in the Financial District, the okay. wall will be constructed as you, the Mr. money Ford. was given to us by the federal government to do. And our local officials have done nothing. So you will build that wall. Thank you, Mr. Absolutely. Sleeper. David? Mr. Slee, well, let's uh, turn to the issue of homelessness. Um, in the last few years, I think it's fair to say it's become a crisis in New York. My question is, for those of us who our heart goes out to these people, what do you do about that? And on the other hand, many, many New Yorkers don't want to see them camping out on our streets. What do you do? Well, uh, all you got to do, Dave, is look at my track record working for, with the emotionally disturbed and the homeless for 42 years as leader of the Guardian Angels. We've been out in the streets tending to their needs, getting them food and clothing, these lost souls. And the answer of de Blasio and his horrible director of homeless services, Stephen Banks, that my opponent, Eric Adams, said, oh, he's doing an excellent job. I would keep him on if I'm elected mayor. 80 shelters shoved into neighborhoods, no transparency, no services for the homeless. They have to get in by 10 o'clock at night. They're kicked out the door. They cause all kinds of problems as a result. We are not compassionate. We are not caring. I would like you, Eric Adams, to condemn your partner and your teammate, Bill 
Bill de Blasio for the worst Thank of you, the Mr. many Scott. worst programs he's conducted. And please say you're not going to hire Steve Banks if you're lucky enough to get an elected mayor. Mr. Adams, what's your, what's your plan? A real issue. And uh, let's be clear. These are our neighbors. These are our former uh, residents that live next to us. And there is a level of compassion that comes with it. And so here's my plan. Number one, we have 25,000 potential apartments we can build, permanent apartments, not homeless shelters in our auto boroughs and those hotels that we can retrofit. Number two, we have to stop the homeless crisis by ensuring we do housing subsidies for those children and families that are being displaced from their homes. Number three, we need the judges to use Kendra's law appropriately for those who can't take care of themselves. That's the street homelessness. And then let's partner our police with many to health professionals so we don't have homeless in our subway system and there's nothing dignified about sleeping on the streets. Build trust, invest in programs like Fountain House and we can turn this homeless crisis around. As a follow up, Mr. Adams, you mentioned the 25,000 units. Um, hotels, and you mentioned in the outer boroughs, but why, why shouldn't Manhattan have to share in that? No, then they should. Now remember, I'm not saying these are going to be shelters. We need to be clear on that. It's permanent housing. The, the hotel and our tourism is going to return faster in the outer borough, in the, in the Manhattan's business district. When you go to the outer boroughs, you're watching hotels that are boarded up, and many of them were built to be shelters. We have to get out of the shelter business and get in the business of giving people okay. permanent housing. The congregate housing, our shelters are no good. We're going to, that's too much waste of taxpayers' dollars. We're moving into building permanent housing in the city. Mr. Sliwa, Excuse you me, uh, Eric. There are empty hotels in Manhattan, some that are boarded up. The only time you come to Manhattan of late is to go to this Euro Bond Club late at night, that private club where you get wine dined in pocket line by a lot of these people who own those hotels. You're gonna stick more homeless people in Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, and exempt Manhattan? Come on, that's tricknology, Eric. We know what the deal is. You even said those hotels in the outer boroughs were built to be shelters. You deny saying that, Eric? You deny because you said it. Come on, don't use any tricknology here. I'm too street to smart for that. Uh, I say over and over again, we don't have to respond to that. My record is clear on finding housing, and I had one of the greatest housing booms in my borough, and the money we allocated. I'm, I am truly, my record is extremely clear around these complex issues. Let's, uh, let's move on to the next subject. Mariella? Yes, has to do with immigration. Uh, Mr. Adams, for you, right now, an estimated 600,000 people living in New York City are classified as legal non-U.S. citizens. They are immigrants who are here legally, but they can vote in elections. So right now, there's a proposal in city council to allow them to vote in local elections. Would you allow that, sir? Uh, I think it's uh, so important to have those documented uh, New Yorkers green card uh, should have the right to participate in local elections. Uh, my understanding, the law department states uh, that the state must carry that out. That's not going to be the power among the city council or our city. And so hopefully the state lawmakers will look at that and make the determination what's the best thing for the city. Mr. Sliwa, will you support that, giving uh, the right to vote to those Legal One of the main supporters residents. of Eric Adams' candidate, uh, candidacy is uh, Idanis Rodriguez, councilman of Washington Heights, who has a green card, which means he's been able to bring his family here. He is able to tap into all the benefits available to citizens. The only thing you can't do with a green card is vote. It's a privilege. Or if you have a work visa, I would maintain it as it is. If you want to be able to vote, Idanis Rodriguez and those with green cards could become citizens. They just have to take the test, but they choose not to want to be citizens. You have to ask yourself, why after all this time would Idanis Rodriguez not want to be a citizen of the so United the, States, so sir, the but answer, simply a green card The answer card is holder. you would not give them the no right privilege to vote, to vote. local elect. These are local elections. You would not give them the right to vote. No. No privilege. No, no that's okay. a privilege for Thank you very American much. citizens. Um, gentlemen, I want to ask you about the current mayor. Uh, mayor de Blasio has been in office for nearly seven years and ten months. Direct questions. What do you think have been his biggest successes, his biggest failures? And if you were a teacher, what grade would you give him? Let's uh, start with Mr. Sliwa. Yes, sir. Is there a grade below D minus F? 
The guy has been a miserable failure. He has single-handedly taken a Miley Cyrus wrecking ball to this city that we love. When he marches in the streets, he gets booed. When he goes to Prospect Park for two hours a day to basically walk around with blah, 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 blah. His own fellow residents from Park Slope, very liberal and progressive, were booing him, catcalling him. So where did he retreat to? Greenwood, the cemetery nearby. I just want to make it clear. What's, what's his, what is his biggest success and what's his biggest failure? Best success pre-K, right out of the box. I was a supporter of that. After that, it's been all downhill. I can't wait till he leaves us and goes back to Cambridge because he has destroyed you, this city. Thank you, and Mr. he's been your partner. Mr. You, Adams. you partnered up with him, Eric Adams, for eight years. Mr. You've Adams, part what, of that. what grade would you give the mayor after uh, seven, nearly seven years and 10 months? And what's his biggest success and biggest failure? Uh, um, well, knowing how important education is, I say this all the time, if you don't educate, you'll incarcerate. Uh, what he has done with pre-K and 3K laid the groundwork of what I would like to build on because I believe uh, education is Pregnancy through profession. I think that was a real success. And I will also look at the municipal ID program. Many people were not accessing services because they did not have proper identification. If I were to look at where I believe we could have done better, clearly homelessness. I believe we could have done a better job with homelessness and finding inefficiencies in our agencies. Cities are based on the success of agencies with two silos. We're hemorrhaging too much money, and I want to turn that really? around. I would give him a B plus. Um, okay. at a, uh, as a grade. So we have B, a B, did B you plus say and B plus? A, we have a B plus and an F. Thank that's you, social promotion at its worst. Right, thank this you, Mr. Sleeper. been a disaster, and you've been his Dave, partner. You've been his uh, team. Dave Evans, a you have a disaster in Brooklyn. Let's thank you, Mr. Sleeper. Let's talk about thank congestion thank pricing, and I, I, uh, I wanted to start with Mr. Adams, if I could. We, we, we learned with uh, recent MTA hearings that the price of driving south of 60th Street is going to be anywhere from $9 to $35 if by chance you don't have an easy pass. Do you accept that simply as the cost of driving south of 60th? Uh, congestion pricing is crucial for our city, not only to deal with the environmental crises that we're facing, but also how do we put more money into our subway system and into our bus system? So I believe, yes, I'm a supporter of congestion pricing. We should have waivers for certain circumstances, but if you are driving alone and you're the only person in the car, you're coming from Connecticut, New Jersey, on our roads, I believe that you should be paying for congestion pricing, and I think we could encourage people to use our public transportation system, our buses, and our trains. And that's why I support it to put the resources uh, in our city. Mr. Slewer, you certainly don't. That's the tax against all those who live in the outer boroughs and north of 60th Street. And by the way, Eric Adams, you want to improve mass transit in the city, subways and buses? How about stopping fare evasion? All the money that's not being paid to take the fare. And by the way, Eric Adams proposed free fare for subways and buses. Eric, how would you possibly financially support free fare for subways and buses when the system can't even support itself? It's hemorrhaging money because you don't want to stop ticket or arrest fare evaders. Okay, very well. To answer the question, Mr. Eric, Sliwa. you want free fare, right, for the subways and buses. Mr. Sliwa, we'll continue with taxi drivers, sir. A question for you right now. As you know, they have taken a huge hit during the pandemic. An industry already crippled with app-based ride-sharing competition. Medallion owners right now are protesting with a hunger strike, demanding more debt relief. They don't think that the current plan uh, from City Hall to give drivers 29,000 loans, uh, free interest loans, are enough. What is your plan to help them? They're protesting right now as we speak. Well, the yellow cabs uh, are outside of City Hall as we speak uh, on hunger strike. Uh, I have spoken to them. They wonder where you've been, Eric Adams. I guess uh, with all your travels, you haven't had a chance to talk to them. But I will tell you this, you have to bifurcate this. There are the oligarchs, the Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs who own dozens of medallions. You don't bail them out. And your newfound friend, Michael Cohen, that's right, you know, you were gonna meet, meet him. So what will be your plan, <laughs> sir? He sir, has dozens of medallions. No to them and sit down with the individual owners and operators with the medallions and see how we can make them whole. That's what I would do as mayor. But no to the oligarchs who have destroyed the yellow cab industry. Mr. Adams, your plan to help taxi drivers right now in desperate need, some of them have $40,000 in loans, in debt. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, the comment of my opponent, that's a far cry from last debate when he just basically wanted to devastate uh, all of these hardworking men and women who have invested everything they had into those medallions. We were wrong at, as a city in what we did. We need to look at those everyday men and women who are the smaller owners of those medallions. No, we don't bail out those who turn this problem uh, into the reality that we're facing. But we cannot ignore those everyday hardworking men and women that thought they were buying into an American dream for it to turn into a nightmare. I'm going to be there for them, and we will find a solution to this problem. And ta taxpayers will pay for that, correct? Is that what you're su suggesting us? For those smaller medallion owners, not for the large individuals, the okay. smaller medallion you, owners. You both agree on something a little bit. Well, yeah. Both are agreeing there. Well, he came around to friend agree. Michael Cohen. You were going to meet with him and Kanye West. Michael Cohen owns quite okay. a few medallions. Did uh, you know that, Eric? Let me talk about something else that's, that's sprung up in the city that is, uh, some people think it's fantastic and it's exciting, and other people say it, it could be problematic. We're talking about outdoor dining, it has sparked excitement, yes, but some say it's also an unsafe condition on the streets. Bike lanes inter intersecting with waiters coming, trying to serve food and cutting off an entire lane of traffic, which has caused some problems and some people sitting with plywood between them and oncoming cars. If you're elected, uh, Mr. Adams, we're going to start with you. If you're elected, would you keep outdoor dining? Uh, yes, I would. I would keep uh, outdoor dining. I think it brings a great energy when I speak with my restaurant owners that I patronize and make sure they keep their doors open to hire cooks, dishwashers, and those who are low-skilled employees. They say to me that helped them survive COVID. Now, do we need to reevaluate? Do we need to look at the structures, make sure they are, are safe? Do we need to look at how we use sidewalk spaces? There's a different way to do it, but I would definitely encourage we have to allow our our restaurants to get up and operating. They had a bellwether for our city, and that is a very important economy for our city, and I'm in support of it. Uh, Mr. Sleward, you keep out redundant. Uh, Bill, I look at some of these uh, Quonset huts, these airplane hangars, you could actually park a 747 in there. That's ridiculous. Others that are unused, that have become shooting galleries where people with drugs are actually shooting up in their necks. They've got to go. And by the way, the reason that so many of the bars and restaurant owners need them is because of the vaccine passport. The ridiculousness that I have to show a vaccine passport to go indoors at a restaurant and then personal ID. I just went to vote with my wife Nancy on Saturday. You didn't have to show a vaccine passport. You didn't have to show an ID. But to get a cheeseburger and fries, you got to show a vaccine passport and ID. That is crazy. And as a result, diners end up going to New Jersey, Westchester, Connecticut, Long Island, where they don't have to show a vaccine passport or ID. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the air different, thank you. Bill? Is the air different in New York City than it is in the in the tri-state yes. area? This is ridiculous. All right, uh, let's move to the next round. David, you've got the question. Mr. Sliwa, we have found uh, since the pandemic began that more and more people are biking than ever before in New York City. Yet you have yeah. talked about eliminating bike lanes. Why? Well, not eliminate. Uh, basically look at them. Many of these bike lanes have been up a year or more. If you use it, you keep it. Many people have used the bicycle lanes well. But there are vast areas of our city, especially in the southern ends when you go into Brooklyn and Queens and northern Bronx and most of Staten Island where they haven't used it at all. But that, but that would be they eliminated. Why not, why not promote in those areas? Well, they have been promoted. They're just not using it. So you take it back. But I can understand why Eric Adams would want to be riding his bicycles when you have 14 reckless endangerment tickets for speeding through school zones. Maybe, Eric, it's better if you just stay on your bicycle and get away from behind the wheel. So I, I promote you bicycling and not driving a car. Because normally under those circumstances, they seize your vehicle, which is recently what you said. They should okay, seize Mr. Adams, vehicles. Mr. Adams, you have the bench. <laughs> I'm, I'm an avid uh, rider. Uh, I enjoy riding. Uh, I think it's so important. I always say uh, one solution should solve a multitude of problems. I would promote uh, bike usage. I would do it with my elders like we did at Restoration Plaza. I would encourage young people to ride their bikes to and from schools. 
uh, because it could help the childhood obesity by doing exercises. Um, and yes, I would make sure that we have proper enforcement so that people are not creating a dangerous environment by using their bikes. But I believe we need to find alternative methods of moving around the city, and biking is one of them. It's enjoyable. I enjoy okay. it, and I, would, I think Thank we need to continue to expand it um, in our city. We are running out of time. We want to give you one minute of closing argument, so I have a couple quick questions. Uh, uh, questions for you. First, this has been a, a, not a great campaign. I assume you're not going to send each other holiday cards uh, come December. <laughs> um, say, could you say something nice about your opponent? And let's uh, let's start with Mr. Adams. Of uh, the the cats. Of uh, you know, I, I take my hat off to Curtis. What he's doing um, with cats. I think we need to be humane to all living beings, and that's include our animals. And uh, as a person that believes it's important uh, that we show compassion uh, to each other and to our, our animals. And so I commend him for what he's doing uh, around uh, cats. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Thank Sliwa, you. you have the I, I commend Eric, who I've known for years. I had a much friendlier time between the <laughs> both of us. And his promotion of the vegan way of life to avoid serious medical issues has probably already helped dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of people. So I applaud you for that because I have seen the results of people who end up dying and suffering and in pain because they get caught with all kinds of problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, high tension. As someone who has been in a hospital many, many times, I hope one day to be a vegan. I'm working on my way. My wife, Nancy, is getting me there, Erica. I'm like at the vegetarian stage. It's very nice to see both of you laughing and also uh, be gentle and kind to each other. I appreciate that. Uh, quick question. Are there any commissioners that, or anyone else in the administration, Mr. de Blasio, you would like to keep if you were elected mayor? Mr. Sliwa, you have that first. Absolutely not. Clean sweep. Out they go. They're fired because they are the Blasioites. Mr. Adams. Uh, we're going to do a real evaluation, and I say this over and over again, a term that's never used. Uh, it's about making sure that we have people who love the city, emotionally intelligent, and have great ideas. And so institutional knowledge has a role, but we're going to take an analysis of everyone that's in government. Okay. Uh, also, what would surprise people? And again, about 15 seconds for each answer. What would surprise people most about you? Mr. Adams, you start first. Uh, you know, I watch five heartbeats all the time, and I cry every time at the end of the movie. I'm just a softie when it comes down to movies. Mr. Slewa. Electronic dance music. I'm 67 years. I love electronic dance music. It is my mood elevator. <laughs> I listen to it as soon as I get back from the subways and the streets and campaigning. EDM, electronic dance music. There you go. Uh, your top priority, one single top priority if you got elected, 10 seconds each. Mr. Sliwa. Be able to choose a police commissioner who is from the department, not outside the department, and interview Latinos and Latinas who never get interviewed for that position. Mr. Adams. Public safety and justice, that's the prerequisite to prosperity, public safety and justice. We have to be safe in our city. Gentlemen, thank you very much. It is time now for closing statements. You each have one minute, and by the rules, we begin with Mr. Sliwa. Ustedes me conocen. That means you know me for 42 years. And what I will bring to City Hall is compassion and caring, which has not existed from either of the political parties. And as Eric had mentioned, I am the first candidate to say when elected there will be no kill shelters. We're not killing any dogs or cats or animals again. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, a society that does not take care of its animals does not take care of its people. Look at the emotionally disturbed. Look at the homeless. We've got to show compassion and caring and void out what de Blasio has done. And I only would have wished you would have used your bully pulpit, Eric, to criticize Thrive and all these other programs that have done nothing but make the problems worse. I guarantee you, I swear on my parents' grave, I will not forsake these lost souls or the animals in our community. We will no longer kill them in our shelters. Okay, Mr. Adams, do you have a minute? Thank you, New Yorkers. This has been an amazing experience. Uh, I am uh, the symbol of the American dream. The only country on the globe where dream is attached to our name. No other country. And when I think about overcoming poverty, overcoming injustices, to become a police officer, a state senator, and now I'm the Brooklyn Borough President. 
I know and you know that far too many people leave the nightmarish realities of somewhere else and come here to experience that American dream. Only place you could have a dollar in your pocket and then on banks. Only place where you could not understand the language and open English speaking schools all over. Only place where you could work in the mailroom and then run for mayor. I want the dreams, those 10 million dreams that are ready to wake up, to know just as my dream is becoming a reality, I want yours to become a reality. This is the greatest city and the greatest country on the globe. And I know what we can do. The way goes New York goes America. And the way goes America goes the globe. Thank you so much. And thank you, gentlemen, for your closing arguments. Thank you for running. It is not easy to do. It's not easy to open yourself up to public scrutiny. But you have both done that, and we appreciate that. And on that note, that's going to end the final debate in the race for mayor of New York City. Candidates, we do, again, thank you for your participation. And to our viewers, thank you because you too are trying to find out information about these two candidates. And we hope we have been a little helpful in that effort. In fact, a lot helpful, hopefully. Either way, we urge you to vote on November 2nd. It is your right and your responsibility. Early voting, of course, already started, continues until Sunday. You can find more information about voting on the Campaign Finance Board's website. To our sponsors, to all of them, thank you for your input and your commitment to improving the city and to my colleagues. David Evans of Eyewitness News and Mariela Salgado of Univision 41 News. Thank you for questions that were insightful and filled with curiosity. If you missed any of this debate or just want to see the whole thing again, we have it on our website, abc7ny.com. Thank you for watching tonight. We do help, hope that we have been helpful. We do. We'd love to hear from you. From all of us here, we wish you health and peace and let's take care of each other. Candidates, thank you again again. Good luck to you.